problem with the 21st century is that nothing is perfect anymore. We don't let ourselves be fooled, not even on TV. Reality shows are everywhere. You can't find the evening TV showing the perfect family anymore. Well, except in maybe commercials for washing powder. This wave of disillusionment hasn't even spared the superhero genre. The superheroes of the 21st century are no longer what they were. Well, maybe that's just my impression. I'm not really an expert in the field, but the comics I read as a teenager, Superman never had an identity crisis. Today, Spider-Man struggles with the question of whether he wants to be a daredevil or if he wants to start a family. Batman throws tantrums while the Joker explains to him how the world works. These obvious weaknesses are simply reflecting the zeitgeist, but one thing hasn't changed. In the final battle, heroes never fail. Nobody wants to see something like that. But why not? Why can we only tolerate superheroes' crisis temporarily? It seems that we still demand for that ideal. We love strong, beautiful, victorious figures. Doubts and conflicts, yes, to create sympathy with a character, to increase the tension. But in the end, the good guys should be good and clearly superior. Humans simply long for perfection in any form. Some train their bodies to perform extreme athletic feats while others strive for a perfect appearance. Some consume upscale products, others travel around the world and search for their own paradise. Still others aim for perfection in music or the arts and even if we ourselves are more average, we all have our idols. We want it like that, we admire them. In our love relationships, we also search for the ideal superwoman or the man of our dreams. At least we let ourselves dream about it, no matter how old we are. I attended a student work group only for a couple of hours with a girl called Christine, but I will remember her story for the rest of my life. She had a petite and sensitive appearance. She had found the man of her dreams in her early twenties, and Christine was immediately fascinated by his playful, adventurous behaviour. There was something sensual and wild about him, and she just hadn't expected this from a soon-to-be pastor. It was a heavenly combination, piety and manhood. And she adored him. She needed him. She loved it when he paid attention to her. She didn't want to live without him. What Christine experienced is actually nothing special. Everyone who has ever really been in love with somebody knows that. You are not only enthusiastic, you also project all your wishes and dreams onto the other person. Everything revolves around him or her. You invest lots of energy into pleasing the other person and you expect a completely new life. As people in love, we become devotees. Dozens of song lyrics express this intensity such as you are the sun, the stars, the moon, you are my world, you are my life. Or, everything I do, I do it for you. Take my life, I would give it up, I would sacrifice. These words seem greatly exaggerated when viewed from a neutral perspective, but that doesn't make them less attractive. We want to feel like this, we want to find somebody we simply have to give ourselves up to because he is so fascinating.
This willingness to devote oneself makes us human and it makes us extremely vulnerable. Because adoring somebody also means that I give that person power over my life. I'm making my happiness dependent on someone else. I'm letting somebody else determine my fate. Take Christine as an example. She married the man of her dreams after one year. Two years later, she moved back to her parents' house, divorced and with a baby. In a personal crisis, her newlywed husband had given up his pastorate to become a soldier, but this wasn't enough for him. Attempting to rid himself of any and all responsibility, he betrayed his young wife, and finally he withdrew completely from her and his small daughter. Christine's emotional wounds are very deep, and understandably so. She hadn't only lost the love of her life, but the money she had lived on, her self-confidence, and her trust in relationships in general. For some time, she struggled with depression. She had to rebuild her self-esteem from scratch. I wish her experience was an isolated incident. Now, of course, her story and her disappointment were on the extreme end of the scale, but we all know innumerable cases in which people make themselves dependent on other persons not worth their devotion. And every time something is destroyed within them, I've noticed that it's not only in relationships that we are humiliated, because no matter what I idealize or glorify, it influences my life. It becomes the benchmark that defines me. For example, if I'm fascinated by the world of fashion, by perfect Photoshop bodies, and I judge myself by this ideal, then, of course, I see myself as fat, spotty, and unwanted. If the world of the rich and their status symbols magically attract me, then I will always have to be ashamed of what I have. These are only two classical examples. How many inferiority complexes result from false idealization and how much bad fortune stems from unworthy goals? We elevate the wrong things, we let ourselves be humiliated. And if you adore nobody and make yourself the centre of your striving, then you go around in circles instead of growing. You lead a lonely life, you humiliate yourself. But is it possible to simply get out of this system? John was granted to do it at least for a couple of hours. In a vision, he simply walked through an open door and was suddenly in a totally different world. So different that when trying to describe it, he reached the limits of language. There are no words for what he saw. At once I was in the spirit, and there was before me a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. And the one who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Ruby a rainbow that shone like an emerald encircled the throne, and from the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings and peals of thunder. In the front of the throne, seven lamps were blazing, and these are the seven spirits of God. Also in front of the throne, there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. John gave it his best, but he had no chance. The centre of his vision was the indescribable, the almighty, the only divine, the ruler of the universe. His light, his power, his appearance are not of this world, even if the beings who live continually in his presence 
haven't gotten used to how perfect and holy he is. In his vision, John sees four triplicate winged angels like creatures on the throne. Possibly these are the most brilliant and mightiest creatures described in all of the Bible, but with all their genius, they only have one thing in mind, God's greatness. Whenever the living creatures give glory and honour and thanks to him who sits on the throne and who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and say, You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honour and power, for you created all things, and by your will they were all created and have their being. What a scene. It's not only the four creatures who worship God. There are also these 24 people. Their crowns or victor's wreaths signalize that they are beings in an honorable position. What impresses me is their decisiveness. They bow down and lay their crowns before God's feet. They have no doubt. It's the most natural thing in the world. You alone are worthy. Why? For you created all things and by your will they were created and have their being. This makes sense. God is the origin. He always stands at the beginning of the chain. There is nothing before him, no matter what impresses us, beauty, intelligence, giftedness. Actually, these things only exist because God created them. He is all this in perfection, absolutely unreachable. And without him, we are dust. John saw the chamber of the throne, and in this chamber of the throne, beyond our perception, the longing for the perfect ideal finds its fulfillment. The reason it isn't that easy for us is because of the battle between Michael and the dragon, and because the dragon continues his war on earth even after his defeat. In chapter 12 of the book of Revelation we come across it, and in the following chapters, 13 and 14, we will see how this conflict escalates. More and more it's all about the one question, who is worthy to stand at the very top, and who is worthy of being adored? And the conclusion at the climax of chapter 14 is, adore the one who created the heavens and the earth, the creator of the universe. And with this, the last book of the Bible again leads us back to the first book of the Bible at the beginning. How was it when God created the earth? God saw all that he had made and it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning, the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. 
everything was good. The Bible says God spoke and it was done. He brought things into being in a completed form. Every creature was perfect. It wasn't a struggle for survival or complex calculations that brought the world to culmination. It was his word. Do you know what that means? That life is a pure gift. The value of man is not to be found in his ability to survive. Humanity doesn't have to create the natural world. The creator does this for them. They just exist perfectly and they can relax. They are simply extremely valuable without having done a thing. What a contrast to our today's attitude towards life. We are beyond Eden. All of nature is characterised by a struggle for survival and our whole society by competition. Has the Creator forgotten us? The book of Revelation says no, we have forgotten him. He is worshipped throughout the universe only not by us and that's why we as humans are lacking the most important thing, our identity the knowledge of our origin, our meaning, our worth, and we still have worth. We still have, no matter how imperfect we are, with God. If we could just stand before him now in the chamber of the throne where John stood and realize that we are his creatures, then we could be healed from our chronic disease. First, we wouldn't always have to pursue a doubtful ideal. Second, we wouldn't always have to prove ourselves but would simply know that we are important. Everything else that we adore robs us of our dignity. God gives it to us. That's why the book of Revelation is right where it says that only God is worthy to stand above all. I have a storybook by Max Lucado about Punchinello. He lives in a world of living wooden figures. They've all developed their own system of evaluation. The beautiful and the great get more and more shiny stars from the others. The common figures, on the other hand, get black marks. Punchinello suffers from this pressure until one day he meets Lucia, and for some reason or other, the stickers don't stick to her, neither the good ones nor the bad ones. She lives in a relaxed way. According to her, the reason for her serenity is her daily visit to the great Whittler who created all dolls. Punchinello hesitates for a long time, but finally has the courage to visit the Whittler, and he and the master have a touching conversation. Punchinello learns that the black marks only stick to him because he takes them so seriously. Why is Lucia free of that? Because she has decided that it's more important what I think, explains the master. Visit me daily, he suggests, so that I can remind you how important you are to me. On that day, Punchinello loses his first black mark. The book is written in a sensitive way and is beautifully illustrated. In fact, it's not really a children's book. We grow up and still suffer from this pressure. We are compared to others and expected to be perfect. I often wish to distance myself from how other people evaluate me. And the place where I can experience this relief is God's throne. You can compare him with no one. And he still notices me. I lay my crown before him. Whenever I worship my creator, I know who I am. 